All right. So we're gonna we're welcoming David L. Gulen. Um, you're the former book critic for the Los Angeles Times, 2015 Guggenheim Fellow, uh, author and editor of a dozen books. No, we're now at like close like 17. This one is this is the seven, this is the 17th. 17th book. Awesome. Congratulations. Um, including sidewalking, coming in terms of Los Angeles, uh, Novella Labyrinth, um, The Lost Art of Reading, Why Books Matter in a Distracted Time, um, Library of America's Writing Los Angeles Literary Anthology, which won the California Book Award. Um, and you have a new book coming out pretty soon. Uh, yeah. And this is a novel. Uh, and how many how many novels have you done? Uh, this is my second. There's also a novella that was published in 2012. Got it. Cool. Um, and this one um, is a little different from your other work. I mean, is this is a noir? Is this yeah. kind of a, a new uh, kind of frontier for for you artistically? Or as a writer, yeah. I mean, I've been fascinated with the genre and read deeply in it and written about it for years. Um, and I did edit um, one of the Acacia Noir anthologies, oh, cool. um, Cape Cod Noir, which featured a short story of mine in it. That was the, but I think the, that story and this novel are the only two pieces of, um, of, of, of noir that I've written. Although there definitely, there's a kind of, I, it, it's, it's part of my, um, my fascination with the genre, particularly the existential aspects of it is definitely colors a lot of my other writing, I think. That's awesome. So, um, and the the so the the title of this work it's a thirteen question method. That's uh, direct. Is that derived from the Chuck Berry song? Yeah, it's it's um, it's it's it took its name from the Chuck Berry song. Awesome. And so, um, I guess uh, one of the um, let's let's start. Uh, I, I like to give you know our readers that aren't super familiar with your works kind of like an, a little bit of idea of, of who you are and like your influences and stuff. So. Um, are you, uh, did, where, where'd you grow up and, uh, you know, like what kind of like, uh, was, what, what kind of first fascinated you about, uh, literature and, and specifically, uh, getting into the writing aspect of it? Um, I grew up in New York and lived there most of the, I mean, traveled around a bit, but lived there most of the time until I was, um, in my late twenties when I moved to Southern California. Um, I grew up in a house full of books. So my father uh, was and still is a, an avid reader. There were, you know, thousands of books in the house. My mother was a former English teacher. Um, and I think the two of them, you know, and the one he, he kind of influenced me as a reader. And she, I think, kind of influenced me or taught me stuff about being a writer. I don't think it was particularly conscious in the early days, but I did want to become, I knew I wanted to be a writer from basically the moment that I realized that, you know, someone made books, like they didn't just exist in the world, but that it was somebody's job to create them. I was like, that's the job I want. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because I love them. I mean, partly, you know, again, partly as I was the oldest, my father, you know, when I was a little kid, he was, you know, I, I, you know, I idolized him. I followed him around. I wanted to do what he did. I, I've said, I've told this before, you know, when I was like, four or five years old, I thought that, you know, a grown-up man, there were four things you had to do to be a grown-up man. You had to read, you had to drive, you had to smoke, and you had to, um, no, I forgot the fourth one, read, drive, smoke, and shave. Those were the four things that made you an adult now. So, <laughs> yeah. so I have, I, you know, I, I no longer smoke, but I have done all of those things. <laughs> awesome. And so I think, you know, that was part of it. You know, I, I just, um, I really, I loved reading. I wanted to do it. Saul Bellow says, you know, writers are readers in, begin as readers in in, in emulation or in, in imitation. And so I think that that it was always kind of in my head from when I started to be aware of, of books as a created object that I wanted um, to try and write. And I started trying to write, you know, I wrote my, first, my, I, my quote unquote first novel, I, you know, 30 pages or so when I was, I think in fifth grade, sixth grade. Um, and I just, you know, I, I, I never, I never stopped. So you continued, you wrote all the way through, like from a young age, just continued. yeah, from a young, from a young, I mean, I didn't complete anything as a young, at a young right. age. But I you wrote, just kept working I wrote all the way through. Yeah. I, I wrote all the way through and, you know, I worked on, um, you know, I, I took creative writing classes. I wrote, um, in a variety of genres. I wrote a play when I was in high school, I wrote a novel, as a senior thesis in college, um, a really bad novel, but a novel nonetheless. 
Um, and so it kind of, yeah, it was just, it was always part of, um, it was always part of my, my, my world, part of my interests. So it was something I was doing. There was, I always had a project cooking. Awesome. Um, did you have any, uh, uh, are there any mentors that you had along your uh, writing journey that sort of stand out in your mind today? I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, early on, not really. I mean, I had, um, I was basically figuring it out on my on my own. Um, I will say that um, I had a teacher in eighth grade. The first sort of extended piece of writing I did, um, which was an extra credit project, I mean, I did it on my own, and then I turned it into my eighth grade English teacher. Um, was a I guess I would call it a novella at this point. It was about a ten thousand word piece of fiction um 60 handwritten pages the biggest thing I'd ever written and I turned it in I was really proud of it and I turned it into this teacher and she took it apart and I was wounded but then I realized that she was you know she was taking me seriously and she was taking this seriously and that was really helpful to me I wouldn't exactly call her name was uh was Mrs. DeFazio I wouldn't I don't know her first name I wouldn't necessarily say she was a mentor but that was the first moment I had where I realized that um, criticism could be useful or, you know, a critique of your work could be useful. And that sometimes someone was doing you the best service by telling you what didn't work about a piece of writing that it wasn't that they weren't insulting you, they were trying to, you know, to direct you. So I think there's that to an extent. Um, I kind of was mentor of verse in high school and college, or maybe even not kind of um, absolutely mentor of verse in high school and college. <laughs> Um, and then when I moved to Southern California, I got to know Carolyn C. And she became a mentor for me in all kinds of ways, not necessarily in terms of the content of my writing, but just in terms of thinking about how to build a literary life, um, thinking about how to build literary life in, in Southern California, um, thinking about place, thinking about um, doing a variety of things. You know, you write your books, you write reviews, you teach. Partly you do that because you need all those pieces to make a living, but also it really is a three-dimensional life. You're not just a writer sitting in a room. You're, you know, you're, you're editing your, let me quit out of that so I don't have that bother me again. Um, you're editing your, you know, you're critiquing, you're part of this kind of multi-hued conversation about literature and that was you know that in terms of sort of the direction of my career the, the that has, that was a hugely and she was a huge influence and a um and an astonishing mentor for 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 many years awesome and where did you where did you say that you uh met her i was asked to do an interview when i first moved to i was already i was already doing um i was already doing a lot of uh book and cultural criticism and journalism when i moved to california and one of the first assignments I got when I moved here, I moved to uh, Southern California in 90, 1991. And one of the first assignments I got was to do an interview with her for, she had a novel that had just come out called Making History. This was in the fall of 91. And I was lost. I was here, I'd been here for a few months and it didn't make any sense to me. I was like, this place, I don't even know how to navigate it. There's, you know, no, there's nothing happening. So I went, she had a, she lived in Topanga and I drove out to her place and we, um, you know, we sat down. I thought it was just going to be a straightforward interview. You know, we were sitting in this beautiful deck on this beautiful deck overlooking the canyon. Um, you know, at a certain point she broke out a bottle of wine and I stayed, I was there for like three or four hours. And we, I mean, I wrote the piece and did the interview, but we became, um, we became friends. And then I mean, she died uh, about, oh, actually now about seven years ago. So we were friendly, um, up until she died. Awesome. Cool. Um, and um, what, uh, uh, something I kind of like always like to ask is, you know, uh, if you can name some of your, some of your major inf like influences, either writers or, or just specific works, you know, that um, mm -hmm. I don't know, had big impacts on you on your journey. Yeah, no, I mean, I, you know, I sort of, in, in some ways, my influences are fairly, well, I mean, you know, obviously, the beats were a big set of influences for me when I was young, yeah. um, as they are, I think, for many people, um, I was drawn to the kind of that kind of countercultural point of view, I was drawn to the romance of, you know, driving cross country and all those things, which I did um, a fair amount of in my teens and 20s. Um, I was drawn to the autobiographical nature of the work, or let's call it the self-mythologizing, which I think is also part of, in, in retrospect, is part of what makes the, some of those works complicated and challenging. Um, but I still kind of am drawn to, I, I love the idea that you could make art out of your own life. So that was an early 
set of um, of influences that I think linger in that sense that so much of my work is particularly well the nonfiction is all autobiographical but so much of of my work um, up until this novel have been has been really autobiographical. Um, from there, I think the segue point would be well. I should also mention another early influence was the writer Larry McMurtry, whose work I fell in love with when I was in eighth and ninth grade and read. Um, at that point, he had, he had only had about he only had seven novels. I read all those books. Um, because they were so steeped in place. You know, he was writing about Texas, which was a place I had not been to at that point, although later I spent some time there. Um, but it was the first inkling I had of kind of the importance of place or place as a subject. And place is obviously very important to um, to my work as well. And then the third kind of pillar, I guess, in that, in that triad was Didion, who I discovered. Um, I was living, I took a year off between high school and college. I was living in San Francisco and um, I, my mother of all people who did not recommend books, I think she was afraid I was never going to come back and that I was just going to, I mean, I was a latter day hippie. So this is 1980. Um, I mean, long past the heyday, but I was living on, on hate. I was living in the hate. And um, so she said, you need to read this essay. There's this book by a writer named Joan Didion called Slouching Towards Bethlehem. And you need to read the hate Ashbury essay, which was the title essay. So I went out and bought the book and I did read that essay. And it was useful for me for a lot of reasons, having nothing to do with what my mother wanted to me to learn from it. But that's a, another whole story. But I read the book and then I immediately went out and bought the White Album um, and read that. I still think of those books as kind of, you know, uh, as like one long book. And what Didion gave me was a sense, uh, what maybe the final piece of that early um, literary influence was that I could write about my own, I could write about um, like public events, right? If I wrote essays, I had not thought about writing essays at that, up until that point, I was always had conceptualized myself as a fiction writer. All of my, you know, baby writing was writing fiction. Um, and Didion, that those books in particular gave me the, like taught me that I could, write autobiographically, but also culturally and socially that there didn't have to be a divide between those things. And that writing about my own time and a la McMurtry, my own place and myself in context of, in the context of those things could be a really powerful combination of elements. And so I think the three of them, to, the three, those three sort of influences together, there are certainly other influences as well, but those three in particular are probably the most directly influential on the work I went on to to do as a writer um do you have la figured out now <laughs> no. <laughs> no one will ever have la figured out that's what makes LA such a strange that's, and wonderful that's place correct. To write about. <laughs> that's correct uh so um what about what about for the for the 13 question method like uh do you have some specific uh you know um influences that or i guess what was like the the impetus to this particular project was there was a number of things was it something specific that uh, it was was a lot it was it was a lot of things and like a lot of and i think actually probably like all of my books i may be lying about that but i don't think so um or certainly most of my books it was a long incubation period like i i i'm a i'm a slow writer until i am a fast writer right and sometimes that has to do with conceptualizing sometimes that doesn't even have to do with the process of writing um i always sort of i read a lot of crime fiction as a kid i didn't be i went I went to fancy schools where it was not encouraged. Um, so I never took it that seriously, but I really loved it. And it was kind of a guilty pleasure, which I no longer believe in as a concept. I believe if, if it's, if, if you draw pleasure from it, then there should be no guilt. You should just, it should just be pleasure. But, you know, um, but I read the, I read a fair amount, you know, all sorts of, sorts of weird stuff. Chandler, um, uh, Chester Himes, some of the cotton, like the, you know, cotton comes to Harlem novels and, um, some other other things like that. I I like those books. I didn't again, as I said, they were kind of you know they were kind of my my leisure reading in a certain sense. I never thought about writing um, in any genre particularly. Um, and then after I got out of college, I got really interested in noir. I just I got I just fell in, down the rabbit hole. Um, partly it was because I had a friend and we were trying to we want we were um, trying to write screenplays and we wanted to write a crime screenplay, so we were looking for a, a book that we could option. Um, and we did, in fact, end up optioning um, a, 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 a noir novel, an obscure noir novel, and you know the the project. You know, we never ended up making a film out of it. Um, so I was reading that way, and I, and I, my earliest sort of experiences writing in the genre was in writing a couple of screenplays in my twenties. But I really um, I fell in love with the genre for a couple of reasons. Um, one was I liked the spareness of it. I liked the kind of spareness and bluntness. bluntness 
and directness. I like, sh I like that, you know, it's the, the books are, you know, they're like a sledgehammer, right? They just, they're propulsive and they keep moving and that's it. Um, I also, as someone who is deeply um, existentially tilted, um, philosophically and, and spiritually and all, um, I really like the idea that they were sort of staring, it was a genre that was staring at the existential abyss without blinking. Um, and I, you know, the, and the, the best writers were doing that. And they had influenced writers like Camus, you know, The Stranger, which is heavily influenced by uh, James M. Cain, among other, Cain and Hemingway, actually, among other writers. Um, and so that it began, I began to think about it in a way that, you know, it could, you could write an existential thriller that could really be about fundamentally about existential despair, which is, was like my jam. So, um, so that was the, you know, the first impetus. And that was a long time ago. I came up with the title of the book and a basic idea for the book, in my 20s but I had no idea how to write it it was something I was I was working on another book at that point and then I you know it was kind of a, a project I figured I'd eventually get to at one point or think about um but it was in my head I had the title I knew the song and I had the title um and originally I think I was thinking of it you know I knew that it would be uh someone would get caught in between two people and there would be an in inheritance dispute and I didn't know quite what would happen but that was the that was the impetus for the story um, I and then when I after I moved to Los Angeles, I played softball with um, a, a friend who's still my friend who lived in a bungalow court in Silver Lake. And one night, one afternoon, Saturday afternoon after the game, I went over to his, his place to have a couple of beers. And, and while we were sitting in his living room, one of his neighbors started screaming. And I said, do we you know, is that what's going on? And he's like, oh, don't worry about that. That, that it happens all the time. And so I literally, sequence is it, it, like, literally right there, I was like, this is the beginning of my book. I mean, I, I still yeah. don't know right when I'm going to write this book, but if I write the book, this is going to be how it begins. So then I had the setting and, and um, in the like 99, I wrote um, four or five pages of it, um, just the opening. And it had it had that first line, you know, the woman across the courtyard was screaming. Um, and then I put it down and didn't do anything with it. Um, and then finally in 19, in 2015, I was between projects and I just started writing it. Um, and over the course of the summer, I wrote the first 75 pages. I wrote myself into a corner that I couldn't get out of. I didn't know how to get out of. I wasn't, I didn't have, you know, I wasn't plotting. I didn't have an outline. I was just kind of writing it as it came. Um, and I, but I, you know, and so I, I put it down. I didn't know what to do. And that was, I was like, okay, well, you know, I, I always meant to go back to it, but I got sucked into other projects, I, you know, finished sidewalking, I did, you know, um, I was teaching, I edited, a, you know, a couple of books, and then, and I was working on a, a, a memoir, and the pandemic hit, and in the early days of the pandemic, I was just like, memory is, I, I don't even know what memory means anymore, it seems completely irrelevant to this super present tense moment we're living in, um, and I couldn't work on that book, and I picked up these pages again, and read them, and as I was reading them, I was like, okay, I, I think I know what has to happen. And then I finished the book in about uh, four months. So I picked it up in August of 2000 and I finished it. Yeah, about four and a half months. I finished it in early January of 2021. Um, so it was a long build, but the but, the, but it was, it, it's been a book that's always been there. And like I say, I mean, those influences are, you know, uh, I mean, Dorothy B. Hughes. Um, uh, there's, I'm also influenced by a lot of, Japanese crime writers. Um, I, you know, certainly Kane, uh, Camus, um, you know, David Goodis, one of my favorites, uh, the great Philadelphia um, pulp writer. Um, and so I wanted to write a book like those books because they were, um, they were unrelenting. They didn't have like false resolution. They didn't, you know, no, there was no redemption at the end of them. And I really was drawn to uh, the idea of writing a story like that. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful book. Everyone's gonna have to pick up a copy and well, what when does it come out it comes out october 3rd october, october 3rd we're coming up quick yeah 10 days it's uh, wow uh yeah we're we're in october pretty much almost i know um so you kind of touched on this um uh a little bit but i mean what is it what is your creative uh process look like and i mean in this particular work and it sounds like a lot of your works you kind of like will start and stop projects uh start and stop right i mean it depends you know it, it it each each book is its own is, so is it just its own thing yeah yeah but now but i've done enough now that there's also i can kind of see what the commonalities are and so what usually ends up happening is um 
Well, with a nonfiction, it often often those books have emerged from pieces. You know, like uh, Myth of Solid Ground grew out of a piece for the LA Weekly about earthquake prediction. And when I finished that piece, I was like, "There's totally a book here." There's I want to do I want to do more. Lost Art of Reading grew out of an essay I wrote for the LA Times, um, and you know, a publisher saw that essay and got in touch with me and wanted to know if I wanted to expand it into a book. At first, I thought I didn't. Um, because I didn't know that I had anything else to say. And then I realized that uh, there's a book I really admire called Ruined by Reading by Lynn Sharon Schwartz. It's sort of a memoir of her reading life. And I realized that I could actually make the lost art of reading a kind of memoir of my reading life. And so I, I, I did that. Um, and Sidewalking too grew out of a couple of, you know, the, the, some of those chapters grew out of, you know, were published in magazines sort of, you know, going back 10 years before the the book came out so the nonfiction grow has grown out of um out of those i you know i tend to circle and write um and throw away a lot of stuff and kind of try and find the voice and try and find the focus at one point um this memoir which i'm back to work on now had so many failed first chapters i was like i'm just going to gather all of these bad first chapters uh up into one book and call it a series of unworkable beginnings it'll be like you know a calvino type book like you know once on a winter's night a traveler um and then at a certain point critical mass hits you know so um it might take me months to write the first 10 pages of something um, and then I'll put it down for a while and then come back to it and write the rest of it in like three or four months. There's always a moment of a tipping point in every book where something happens and then literally the whole back end of the book gets written in like three to six months. Um, you give yourself a daily, like a daily word, like count when you're hitting it? When you're I shoot for a thousand. Mindset. I shoot for a thousand words a day, but I don't beat myself up if I don't hit it. Um, I've done I mean one of the things I've come to realize is like I don't I never I don't want to sit there and force it because if I'm forcing it I'm going to end up having to tear it out the next day so it's it's actually more efficient for me to get up from the desk and when it's when it's when I'm struggling and go do something else and come back to it the next day than it is to kind of sit there and try and force my way through it this the force work always I mean it always goes like I read it the next morning I'm like I don't even know what I was thinking here this needs to go <laughs> Well, all these pages need to go. So, um, so it's that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I and I also, you know, what I'll do when I'm really rolling on something is, I, you know, I start in the morning. I like to write in the morning where I'm I'm fresh and it's quiet. I get up early, and um, I'll start by reading the last couple of days' pages and start and do some edits and fixes, and that kind of gets me in. I often think of it as like getting, you know, it's like you're walking into the water. Um, so that gets me kind of knee deep a little bit and then I can, and, and I'm acclimated and then I can start. Um, it's an, it, I have the impetus at that point to, to, to keep it, to move it forward. So that's basically what I, um, how it operates. Awesome. Uh, cool. Well, um, I think that covers, you know, the questions that I had, uh, the book, the process, it's uh, great, great, uh, great answers. The beautiful it's a beautiful book. We're excited to read it. Um, what um, do you have anything else uh, that you wanted to uh, like convey to our audience? Anything else you're working on? Or I don't think so. I mean, I'm you know I'm, I'm always working on something, but I'm I don't don't generally talk about work in progress. So I I'm afraid to jinx it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 